Are cosmic ray observatories a thing? Could we see the reflection of an ocean on an exoplanet? And could the light pressure from the sun push the planets around all this and more in this week's question show? Hello, and welcome to the question show your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down in the YouTube comments down below, I'll gather a whole bunch of them up here, and I will answer them. But also, we do this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time right here on my YouTube channel. So if you want to join the live show, which is like triple the length, and I answer questions live from the audience, we do follow up questions, the chat chats with each other. It's a fun time. So come join us every Monday at 5pm. All right, let's get into the questions. Ben Breedas, are cosmic ray observatories a thing? Absolutely, cosmic ray observatories are a thing. In fact, cosmic ray observatories have been a thing for over half a century. Uh, you can actually observe cosmic rays down here on Earth. People have built a cloud chamber, and then you can watch as a cosmic ray zips through the cloud chamber and leaves this trail behind, and it sort of reminds you that you're living in this cosmic shooting gallery with all of these high energy particles that are blasting through the universe, through the Earth's atmosphere, through you, causing damage to your DNA. It's a good time. So I mentioned there's like 50. There are a bunch of ground based cosmic ray observatories. There are space based cosmic ray observatories. And there are balloon based observatories. So I just want to just give you a couple of examples. So for ground based cosmic ray observatories, probably the most famous largest one is called the Pierre Auger Observatory. It's mapped over a region of about 3000 square kilometers in Argentina. And it consists of a bunch of big water tanks embedded in the ground, as well as detectors that are watching the sky. And what they're looking for is they're looking for the fluorescence through the air as one of these high energy cosmic particles blast through the atmosphere. And then they're watching for various particles as they pass through these vats of water, and they're able to then try and make some detections about information about these cosmic rays. And the Pierre Auger Observatory is looking for the highest energy, the ultra high energy cosmic rays. And so these are particles that have 10 to the power of 18 electron volts. And I'm sure you're wondering, like, is that a lot? So I ran that through Wolfram Alpha, and I got a few examples. It's something like 15 times more energy than a whisper. <laughs> which is weird, or 150 times the energy it takes to push down a key on a keyboard, or 20% the energy it takes to lift an apple one meter. But the point is that this is all concentrated into one single particle, one atom that is traveling at close to the speed of light with a ludicrous amount of energy behind it. And astronomers aren't entirely sure where these things are coming from, like pick your favorite extreme astronomical object, supermassive black hole, pulsars, magnetars, colliding black holes, like at some point, some extreme event is blasting out these particles and astronomers still are working out the exact source. And that's why you have this really huge surface area detector. So the reason you need a detector this large is that you get like one of these ultra high cosmic ray events hitting in one square kilometer of land every century. So with 3000 square kilometers of detection area, you're going to get 3000 of them a century, or a few every year. And that's all that astronomers are able to use to detect these extreme events. So that's the Pierre Auger Observatory. And then there is another one on the International Space Station called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which has been able to detect cosmic rays. And of course, this is really important for astronauts in space because they are being bombarded by cosmic rays all the time. And so they were able to detect in one year of operation, 17 billion cosmic rays passing through the detectors on the International Space Station. So that's a lot. And there have been cosmic ray detectors on the Voyager spacecraft on Cassini. So like I said, many, many times for half a century. You probably noticed the Star Wars planet that's appeared above my shoulder. And this is a way for you to vote for the question that you thought was the best or the answer that you thought was the best, whatever. Um, so go ahead, watch the entire video, you're going to see those, those planets show up above my shoulder. And then at the end, put in the comments down below the planet that you thought was the best. We missed a week. It's a week 
don't have a winner from last week, but next week we'll have a winner from this week. HPA 97, would it be possible to see the reflection of a moon from the ocean of the host planet, assuming one day we can get enough resolution of exoplanets? Absolutely. So uh, the idea that you're thinking about is that you've got some kind of gas giant planet that is orbiting around another star. And there is a like Earth like planet orbiting around that gas giant. And we are able to observe the planet and to be able to see the glint of the ocean on that planet as it's turning and as it's going around its host star and as it's going around the, the planet. And so astronomers have thought of this. They've thought about like, is there a way for us to be able to detect the presence of liquid oceans on exoplanets? And of course, this is really important, because if you could, then you would be able to confirm that yes, indeed, a planet that is in the habitable zone actually has liquid water on the surface of the planet. So there's two methods that astronomers have proposed to be able to observe the oceans. One is called rotational mapping, where essentially you watch the brightness of an exoplanet as the planet is turning, and you're able to then start to work out the continents and oceans on that planet just based on the changes of brightness. And then the other one is called specular reflection. And that is the ocean glint that you are seeing sunlight bounce off the ocean and come towards us. And you're going to get a couple of advantages. You're going to have a certain amount of polarity to the light that's coming off of the oceans. You're going to be able to have clouds that are going to be passing in front of the glint that's going to make things a little more complicated. And you'll be able to sort of see when you see glint and when you don't to start mapping out the locations of the continents on this exoplanet. So um, is it possible right now? No. But in a paper and I'll link in the show notes down below. It's called Detecting Ocean Glint on Exoplanets Using Multiphase Mapping. And what they suggest is that with a six meter plus space telescope, you should be able to see one exoplanet within range of us and to be able to detect the glint off of the ocean. And we just happen to have a six plus meter telescope available to us, of course, JWST. So in theory, there's like one exoplanet that's a good candidate for doing this kind of searching for ocean glint. We don't know what that planet is yet. We need you know, more observations to narrow down what it's going to be with a 15 meter telescope like Louvoir, then you could do probably 10 different planets. And then of course, we've got some ground based observatories like the upcoming extremely large telescope. So this is going to be a productive way to examine the best exoplanet candidates that we have. And you know, you were imagining it be a moon around a giant planet, but it could just be a planet around a star. The same technique is going to work for both. Jeremy E. Harris, how come the force of the sun's photons acting on planets over billions of years don't slowly change their orbits? Or does it but it's too slow and insignificant to measure? So in theory, yes, the uh, the photon pressure from the sun is pushing on the planets, and it is slowly pushing them changing their orbits. But the amount is extremely small that the sun will die before the planets are pushed in any kind of appreciable amount. But astronomers do know that asteroids get pushed around by the light pressure from the sun. And there's this thing called the Yarkovsky effect. And so what happens is, you get these asteroids that are rotating around. And depending on the direction that they're spinning compared to their direction of orbit around the sun, you're going to get a different either raising or lowering of their orbit. And the way it works is essentially, if they're in a prograde rotation, so in other words, they are turning in the same direction that they are orbiting the sun, then the light pressure from the sun heats up one side of the asteroid, and it sort of turns away, and it starts to get pushed by the light and the heat from the sun, and starts to increase its orbit, it kind of acts like a thruster, and the asteroid will raise its orbit. But if the asteroid is turning in the opposite direction in a retrograde motion, then this effect will cause it to lower its altitude, moving it closer and closer to the sun. And so over long periods of time, this means that the orbits of asteroids is quite random and chaotic. You just can't pin down where asteroids are going to be over long periods of time because of this effect from the sun. Josh Martin, 
Do solar systems have to be in a galaxy or are there stars and planets just hanging out by themselves with nothing else around them? In theory, there are definitely stars floating in between galaxies, they're known as field stars. And so they're just stars that are not a member of any other galaxy and astronomers are able to see them. In fact, there's a lot of them, uh, possibly as many as there are stars in galaxies. But do they have planets? And so for you to have planets, you need to have been through several cycles of being in a star, you needed to be in that initial population three star phase, the one with just the primordial hydrogen and helium. And then you needed to go through multiple supernovae and produce heavier and heavier elements. And so here in the Milky Way, we have regions of the galaxy that are more and less habitable. And so if you are closer to the center of the Milky Way, you're going to have a lot of heavier elements, but you're also going to be blasted by radiation. If you're in the outskirts of the Milky Way, there's less heavier elements, less radiation. And so there's this sweet spot for life on planets away from the core, but not too far into the outskirts of the galaxy. And so you're going to have these field stars that potentially interacted with like maybe a couple of other stars in a blob of gas, a star forming blob out in the middle of some void, but it didn't get to cycle through many different stars to build up those heavier elements to give you the planets. So I'm sure there's going to be exceptions, like I'm sure astronomers will eventually find although it'd be really tricky, but eventually find field stars with exoplanets around them. But you're more likely going to get the planets around stars that are in a galaxy. Leonard segments, what's up with Starliner? Why the latest setback? Oh, Starliner. Of course, CST 100 Boeing Starliner was supposed to be the other private spacecraft that would carry astronauts to and from the International Space Station. So you got the SpaceX Crew Dragon, and then you got the Boeing Starliner. And in theory, the Boeing Starliner was supposed to be operational at the same time that the Crew Dragon was, but they had a bunch of issues. They had a problem with their launch. They had a problem with their flight. Uh, there's been a bunch of safety issues. And so it was supposed to launch in July 2023. They already did an uncrewed flight up to the International Space Station and returned. And they were supposed to do the crewed flight in July, but NASA did a very extensive safety analysis, and they found there was a problem with the parachutes. Uh, they didn't like the way the parachutes deployed. And there was a few other issues as well. And so they've delayed the launch of the Starliner again, it seems like it'll probably launch before the end of the year at this point. You know, and it's a small to do list that is still outstanding. But still, like, obviously, it's getting more and more embarrassing how long it's taking for the spacecraft to launch. But you know, I've mentioned this before with Blue Origin, like you want Starliner to launch, you want multiple options to get humans to and from the International Space Station, the more options, the better It'd be great if there was 10 different ways. Can you imagine if there was only one airline and like you had to fly on that airline if you wanted to go anywhere? No, you want competition. So hopefully, Boeing will figure this out, get through all of the issues and provide another way for astronauts to get to the International Space Station. Samuel Thompson, if we decided to get rid of all the nukes on Earth and send it to the sun, would it cause a massive solar flare to destroy the ozone atmosphere and fry the Earth's surface? No, if you took all of the nuclear weapons on Earth, however many 1000s and 1000s there are, and you just fire them all into the sun, they would just get gobbled up by the sun and they would disappear and it wouldn't even make a burp on the sun surface. You could even detonate them on the surface of the sun. I maybe you'd even be able to detect them like the sun is an ongoing thermonuclear explosion that's right there in the sky that it is gobbling up super tankers worth of hydrogen fuel every second. And we can't hold a candle literally to what the sun can do. But people think about this idea like practically like what would it take to get stuff into the sun and actually the sun is the hardest place to reach in the entire solar system, you have to cancel out the Earth's orbital velocity, we're going 30 kilometers per second around the sun. And the only way to get a payload into the sun is to be able to cancel out that 30 kilometers per second. And we don't have very many rockets that can go that fast, you would have to do a launch, you'd have to do flybys gravitational assist past Venus and Mercury and Earth, and slowly lose orbital velocity until you were able to drop into the sun. So it would be really hard, really cost all the money. And nothing would happen. 
If you like my answers to your questions, as well as the other things we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. And if you do, I will remove all of the ads from the Universe Today website for life. You also get other perks, ad free videos, access to interviews early and other stuff that's exclusive to our Patreon community. So thanks to everyone who's already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers, Vlad Chipelin, Graham Jenkins, Brian Lieb, Christopher Lohr, Julian Rivera, Galactic President Scooper Star McScoops a lot, Ben Brenneman, Andy Leonard, Clayton Hershey, and pseudo Nim. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Up for open should the US rebuild that radio telescope in Puerto Rico. So you're talking about the Arecibo Observatory, which tragically collapsed a couple of years ago. And it was pretty devastating to the field of science to lose this observatory. You've got what was at the time one of the largest radio observatories in the world, the Chinese have a bigger one called fast, which is 500 meters across Arecibo was like 300 plus meters across. But Arecibo was equipped with a radar instrument on board, the likes of which does not exist anywhere else on planet Earth. So it can fire out this radar pulse at a nearby asteroid as it's passing, and then receive the signal and be able to analyze it. And Arecibo was used to map dozens of asteroids in 3d. It's really cool what they were able to do with it. And then with the collapse of the telescope, the administration officials decided that they were not going to rebuild the telescope. But there have been plans, there have been proposals to either rebuild them or make other versions of Arecibo scale telescopes in other places. So you know, there is this gap, there has been a large radar instrument attached to another radio telescope, I forget which one it was. But it won't have the same kind of capability and the fast telescope doesn't have this kind of radar capability. So we're still waiting for that. And so we'll see, you know, it's all about budget, where do you spend your money if you've got limited budget and to lose an entire radio telescope just on one day, uh, it's really hard to recover from that and shift funding around to make that happen. Christopher 485, how can we possibly detect if an exoplanet has magnetic poles? So we can't necessarily detect the magnetic field of a planet, although like maybe eventually we could like astronomers recently were able to map out the magnetosphere around a ultra cool dwarf star. And so they were able to map out the, you know, the shape of the magnetic field, and it really matched very similar to the shape that Jupiter's magnetic field has. But the way you can detect if an exoplanet has a magnetic field is when there's a solar flare and the solar flare interacts with the magnetic field and causes an Aurora. We see that here on Earth, you look up in the sky, you see the Aurora activity. And those Auroras are detected in radio emissions. And astronomers have actually done this, they've been able to detect the radio emissions coming from an Aurora on an exoplanet. And so they were able to detect the existence of the exoplanet at the same time that they detected the exoplanet itself. So it's like a twofer. Gregory Cheney, would wearing a heavy suit on Mars that would match your weight on Earth prepare you for returning to Earth? There's this idea in the expanse series where the Martian troopers wear heavy suits that match Earth gravity, that allow them to build their strength and their bone density. And it makes them really badass for doing fights on Mars as well as on the asteroids. And that theoretically, if they needed to invade Earth, they would be ready to do it while other Martians who haven't gone through the specialized training wouldn't be able to do it and they're able to handle high G maneuvers. So there are parts of being in a very heavy suit that would help you out. Definitely, it would put increased stress on your skeleton, it would increase your muscle mass, it would be like you were working out weightlifting. And I don't think you would need to move around in a suit all the time. But there would be a lot of stuff that would be really difficult. Like you can imagine you would have increased inertia when you're moving your body around. So if you're moving your arms from side to side, they would still feel a lot heavier and harder to move than if you were on Earth. So there are some issues, but there are a lot of other problems health wise that you know, you can't really deal with with a heavy suit. So for example, uh, you know, we talk about the eyesight problems, fluid redistribution problems. But I don't think it would hurt. I can totally imagine like you've got astronauts who have been on Mars for two years, they've been finishing off, and then maybe they wear some increased 
weight suits for the last couple of months while they're there to make that transition. Or maybe they just go for it, right? Like it's not like you're in total weightlessness, you're still in one third gravity. And so you would be able to adapt back to Earth gravity within a reasonable amount of time. But I like the idea. Robert Niccolo, how would SpaceX Starship change future space telescopes? It would be a total game changer. The size of the fairing of the SpaceX Starship is nine meters across. When you think about a regular rocket fairing, it's five meters across. So you could just put JWST into the fairing of Starship and you wouldn't have to unfold all of the telescope instruments. Like you probably still have to unfold the sun shield because it's the size of a tennis court, but you wouldn't have to unfold the telescope. And so it would be a lot simpler. And so a lot of telescopes that went through a very complex procedure of unfolding, you could just fit them just directly into the telescope. Like you could put earth based telescopes into this thing and launch them into space. Not that they would work very well and the low costs. So theoretically, the costs are going to come down by an order of magnitude when Starship starts to fly. And so normally, mission planners budget half their budget for their launch. So if you've got a billion dollars to spend on your mission, you're also going to need to spend or you know, you're going to spend half a billion on your mission, and you're going to spend half a billion on your launch. Now you could spend 950 million on your mission, and you could spend 50 million on your launch. So that's a game changer as well. And to be honest, like we don't know really what the limits are like, like this is a brand new mode of transportation to space of in terms of reuse in terms of size and scale. And we don't really know what it could be used for. And so I imagine like when SpaceX Starship starts to fly, it's going to gobble up the entire existing launch market across planet Earth. Everyone is just they're going to put tiny little satellites inside Starship, because it's still more economical than launching it on a smaller rocket. And then everybody's crazy ideas that they could never launch because it was going to be too expensive, they'll launch that. And then people will be like, well, what do we do now? And then so new ideas will be figured out to use that size and scale and low cost. And so we could see totally different paradigms in what space telescopes might look like. Like what if you built a space telescope for $50 million, and you made it really rudimentary, but it was just big, like it's nine meters across, but it's not very smart. And it's inexpensive, and you fly it to space, and maybe you fly a bunch of them in formation. And then you bring them back down and you repair them. So there's just like new ideas, totally new paradigms we haven't even figured out yet. And I'm really excited for that. So come on, Starship launch already. Tom's cubes and games. Kyle Hill recently did a feature on AI Duff science videos on YouTube. Have you noticed too? I have definitely noticed. Uh, I was actually like browsing on YouTube. And there was this video where there was like a little arrow pointing towards God. And it's like, new discoveries from JWST. And the video got 2.5 million views and had been released just a couple of weeks ago. And you just play the video. And it's nonsense. Like there's no coherent like point being made. It's just a lot of astrophysical word salad being used. Definitely the kind of thing that would be generated by ChatGPT, and there are thousands of these, and they get the kinds of views that I would be jealous to get. And but I have to like do all this work to for scientific accuracy. And um, like, it's brutal, it's heartbreaking to go through this process. And the problem is, is that for most people, like it's got really cool video visuals, and it's saying, you know, black holes, white holes, cosmos, voids, creation discs, right? It's just got it's got all the word salad that you need to make you feel like you're just in tune with the universe. And um, it's a big problem. And it's just gonna get worse, it's gonna accelerate. And so YouTube literally has to figure this out, they have to make a decision like, do we want science content on YouTube that is accurate, and is attempting to be produced by experts who are with an attention to detail? Or do you just want 
pleasing eye candy that sounds kind of scientific and people are going to enjoy it's like uh, it's like the Elsa frozen Spider-Man uh, stuff for kids, right? Like it's just that just on and on and on hour after hour after hour that you just put on while you're at a party. Um, Cause I like, I can't fight that. And if, and if YouTube is going to promote that, then I'm just going to wither to nothing. And Kyle was exactly right. This is a big problem and it's just going to get so much worse. And I, I don't know what the, like, I don't know what the answer is, right? Does someone from YouTube have to look over each video and say, is, was this produced by AI? Is this real? When they mention these facts about the universe, are they correct? Where are their sources? Anyway, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Uh, it's a huge problem. I don't think there's a solution. I don't think YouTube cares. So, uh, so we'll all watch and see what happens together. It's time for the book club where I give you an update on the books that I'm reading and you suggest books for me to read. So the way that you can recommend books at me is that you just go to the Goodreads community that we've set up and you can just go onto one of the discussion forums, add books to the bookshelf. And then as soon as I finish books, I will look through the list, pick the next one that intrigues me and I'll read it. And so this week's book club offering is five books, which is that I've finished reading the first five books of the culture series by Ian M. Banks. So you've got considered plebeius player of games. Oh, I forget the rest of the names. Anyway, so I've read the first five books this week. So um, I'm, I'm really sort of going through them as quickly as, as possible. Because and I've mentioned this before, like, it's really tricky, right? If you give me the beginning of a series, I'm going to want to read the whole series. And then I'm going to want to read all the books written by that author. And so I've been reading the culture series like crazy. I really enjoy them. And I mean, just as a world building universe building idea, they're so great. You've got this advanced civilization that is sort of walking this fine line before they ascend into some alternate dimension future, they still want to exist in the universe, but they have enormous cosmic power and they're able to influence other civilizations. And they're just trying mostly trying to do good. They're trying to ease suffering in the universe. They're trying to um, make friends, have everybody just get along. And and so like, what do you do when you're part of a civilization that is post scarcity where you no longer need to fight wars, nobody ever needs to get old. Um, and so like the second book is about a person who just only plays games, designs games, plays games, and is invited to this world to play the most complicated game probably in the galaxy, where the stakes very stakes of the civilization's culture are on the line. And in the third book, you know, the culture doesn't wage wars, but they interact with wars trying to make wars go away before they start. And so it's told from the perspective of one of these people whose job it is to, to prevent wars. And um, the fourth book is like how the culture interferes with other societies that are all around them. And the book that I'm reading right now, I'm reading the fifth one, and it's it's my favorite so far. And it's very much about what does an omnipotent society do when something even more powerful comes along? And so and it's this really interesting idea, right? That you are so powerful that you don't have that you can be benevolent that you don't have to worry about how awful other civilizations are. It's kind of like when your child has a tantrum. But what do you do if you meet something that is more dangerous, more scary, and you have to seriously uh, sort of fight for for what you believe in? And it's uh, it's an interesting story. So anyway, the culture series, the first five books, I'll let you know next week for the next five books, because I'm, I'm burning through them pretty quickly. But go ahead, post your suggestions for books that I should read in our Goodreads community. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank everyone for asking questions in the chat. Everyone who showed up live at Monday, 5 p.m. Pacific time, and don't forget to vote. If you want to see on top of all the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter 
I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to just Paul Davis, Vlad Shippelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltonet, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.